The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lee Pucker. I'm the CEO of the Wireless Innovation Forum, and I'd like to welcome you all to this eighth in our uh, webinar series. The title of today's webinar is Facilitating Spectrum Sharing by Secondary Systems, and the webinar will be held, uh, be given by James Neal of Cognitive Radio Technologies. A uh, few notes before we begin. Uh, the slides that are presenting during this webinar are going to be posted on our website. Um, you can find them at wirelessinnovation.org slash webinars underscore tutorials underscore resources. Uh, the slides for all of our webinars are located there, uh, all the ones that we've done in the past, uh, as well as um, this will be posted there later today. In addition, uh, we're recording this webinar, so uh, the recording will be located there as well. If you need more information, uh, feel free to contact me. And my email is lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org. A little bit of information on how the webinar tools actually work. Um, you should see a screen like this, a control screen that you're logged into. In that control screen, um, you've got a number of areas. Uh, you can minimize it using the button, uh, the red button on the left, the double arrow button, I'm sorry, on the left allows you to minimize that screen and maximize it to bring it back up. Uh, there's an area there where you can select whether you're using microphone or speakers uh, for your audio, or if you want to dial in using telephone, you can just click the telephone button, and it'll give you all the dial-in information, uh, allowing you to use your phone instead of your, your computer microphone and speakers. Um, when you do that, you need to make sure that you enter your audio PIN. That PIN is what uh, identifies you uniquely in the system so that we can uh, unmute mute you and unmute you during the, during the call should you, should you uh, request that. There's a questions window. Uh, if you have a question uh, about the material in the webinar as it goes on or about anything uh, related to the webinar, uh, go ahead and type that question in. I receive those questions real time, and then I'll pass them on to James. Uh, I'll either respond to them if they're if they're uh, uh, administrative, or I'll pass them on to James to to answer during the webinar. Uh, James has requested that the questions be provided as the uh, as the webinar is going along. So you know, feel free to send a question at any time. There's also the ability if you wish to ask a question. Uh, for you to raise your hand. Uh, there's a little hand icon there. If you click on that, uh, I can unmute your microphone, and then you'll be able to, to, to raise, to uh, ask your question there. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to today's presenter, uh, James Neal, Cognitive Radio Technologies. And uh, James, it's, uh, it's all yours. All right. Should be getting a little, there we go. Show my screen thing, I think. There we go. All right, everyone, can you see my screen? I guess, Lee, you can answer for everyone. Uh, I can see your screen. All righty. All right, so we'll assume this is up and running. Um, as Lee said, my name is James Neal. I'm president of Cognitive Technologies. I am somewhat thinner and somewhat more bald than that picture that was up there. But... Uh, Otherwise, that's who I am. Uh, quick background on CRT. We're a spin-off from Virginia Tech, focused primarily on designing distributed cognitive radio algorithms, and uh, a lot of work with game theory. Uh, we'll very lightly touch on that and uh, uh, go across a bunch of different protocols and then general results for, for coexistence. Uh, this is kind of cut down from a four-hour tutorial down to, I guess, 55 minutes or so. Uh, with questions interspersed. So most of what I'm going to try to be doing is saying, this is important. Uh, go read it on this topic, on this uh, document further if, you, if it's of interest to you. Um, so with that, uh, what we're going to try to cover today uh, is a little background theory and definition of what coexistence is, kinds of issues you tend to have to, to be concerned with, with coexistence, and then uh, some light game theory on uh, uh, how you go about analyzing interactive decision processes and general implications for, for coexistence. And then we'll start looking at some coexistence standards for kind of the last part of, of this talk. So uh, 
coexistence. What do I mean by, by coexistence? If you go in a dictionary and I cut out some words that uh, weren't so, so needed, uh, it'll be a policy of living peacefully with others despite fundamental disagreements. Uh, .15.2, which is a very uh, uh, coexistence standard from 2003, uh, is the ability of one system to perform a task in a given shared environment where other systems have an ability to perform their task and may or may not be using the same set of rules. Um, one thing I want to emphasize out of that is the, the need for coexistence between unlicensed systems uh, had well predates TV white space. So many of the same problems that were seen uh, in, in unlicensed bands show up again in, in TV white space and so you can pull over a number of the, the, uh, the same techniques from before. Uh, but one of the nice things about the TV white space and probably many different cognitive deployments is just satisfying the regulations, i.e. Uh, being able to geolocate yourself and communicate with the database provides a lot of infrastructure which makes uh, implementing more sophisticated coexistence algorithms much, much easier. So then a related term is uh, electromagnetic compatibility uh, with definitions there from, from NATO and IEEE. Uh, and I'll just go through the NATO one, uh, where it's the capability of systems to operate in their intended uh, electromagnetic environment within a defined margin of safety at a design levels of performance without suffering or causing unacceptable degradation as a result of electromagnetic interference. So it's not so much task-oriented in that definition, but acceptable levels of performance. Because the assumption is there is some give and take once you start having to, to share and contend over resources. Uh, and the idea is that everyone's getting enough to do what they, they want to do. So since we're kind of putting this in the context of TV white space, I'm hoping everyone online has some familiarity with this, so I only have one slide on it. Uh, big spectrum crunch in terms of uh, finding enough sp uh, spectrum to allow commercial and, and, and government users to, uh, to find spectrum to, to transmit. Uh, there's been studies that have shown that uh, large fractions of, of the allocated spectrum are underused, up to uh, only 10% in general, uh, maybe uh, in use at any given time, even if it's allocated. Um, so the idea uh, in the TV white space is that since the TV bands are also like that, and that you have large swaths of the country where there are uh, no TV broadcasts and, and no wireless mics uh, necessarily broadcasting or um, other protected entities like uh, cable head-ins, uh, you can find uh, free spectrum to, to use and make use of. And those devices that are operating in that spectrum that would be allocated to those protected users or primary users, those uh, uh, operating in that band are called secondary users. And they're going to have to not only coexist with primary users in terms of making certain that they're not uh, interfering or, or degrading the performance of primary users be beyond an acceptable limit, uh, but also with each other. And the FCC has uh, specified regulations for how you go about ensuring that you're uh, coexisting well with primary users, and that's converged upon a uh, database and geolocation kind of uh, technique for, for the TV white space, and, and similar sort of techniques have been proposed for the 365 band. Um, some light, light registering, and, and there'll be some other techniques that end up having to be developed uh, once we have more aggressive sharing with radar systems. But in general, there's a bit of infrastructure that went into supporting TV white space uh, in terms of that uh, general assumption that you have location and timing information off of uh, off your GPS for at least uh, some of your devices, uh, the devices that are able to, to make decisions on their own. and um, also support of a, a database uh, linked together uh, in, in the network somewhere hiding that uh, everyone has access to, which then could uh, provide a mechanism for coordination, uh, possibly, which has been leveraged by several standards. So uh, I have one slide on, on rules. I'll not cover this because I kind of talked about all of it. Uh, key is that there are different kinds of devices, but there's a database hiding in the background, and, and they're able to locate themselves and they recover time. I'm going to skip over that, too. And I'll skip through several slides because I have 38 slides for 55 minutes. 
Um, but if someone sees something, yell at me and or raise your hand, I guess, in this format, and I'll go back to it. So in addition to TV white space secondary use, um, there's also uh, unlicensed use, and there's also cognitive radios that show up in, the, in those unlicensed bands, even if they're not always called cognitive radios. And so we'll have to worry about that kind of coexistence scenario as well. Um, the ISM band, uh, as many of us are well aware, ends up becoming very interfered. And uh, both from congestion from other dot eleven devices and then uh, a number of other kinds of systems that may be there. So different vendors have come up with different smart solutions to handling that. Uh, a number of the different enterprise solutions will deploy uh, cognitive kind of techniques uh, between the access points and some uh, management software residing in the network uh, where Collaboratively, they'll figure out what kind of interference source is there. Is it uh, a rogue access point? Is it a microwave? Uh, is it a baby monitor? Well, what is it? And then take uh, appropriate steps based off of how they, uh, they classify that signal. That's, for instance, the idea behind the, uh, the clean air spectrum monitor from, uh, from Cisco. And down in the bottom right, there's a bunch of other systems from other uh, vendors uh, that do similar sort of things, uh, Ruba, Motorola, HP, Trapeze, Miru. Um, so that's kind of a spectrum management kind of solution. Um, then Ruckus has a beam forming smart antenna kind of solution that's looking to uh, uh, manage uh, both your transmit beams and your nulls. And you have traditional kinds of algorithms that will do that adaptively on the fly. Uh, with their system uh, will also learn the environment and remember that there are uh, interferers that are likely to be an interferer in an area, uh, so it's not a pure adaptive system. So it's kind of a little cognitive radio there as well. So why do we care that we have these extra cognitive radios running around inside of our our unlicensed bands? How what makes it different? So um, what I have on the screen right now. Uh, is the traditional metaphor for how a cognitive radio operates. Uh, it's described in terms of what's shorthand known as the OODA loop, observe, oriented, decide, and act. Uh, those are the uh, more frequently implemented uh, processes in a cognitive radio. Observe, you're gathering information about uh, what's going on in, in the radio's environment. Orient, you're making sense of what those observations mean. Is what kind of signal is it? Uh, what's uh, is it a primary user, is it a secondary user? Uh, decide you're you're running your uh, algorithm to, to alter how your system operates based off of that, and then the act actually translates that decision to a uh, to an adaptation of the radio, and then running at slower rates, you could be learning or, or uh, planning to select different goals to, to guide the adaptations. So. Well, that's the the notional diagram or the notional metaphor in, in practice. Um, there's going to be a lot of these different systems out there. So what that means is, whenever one uh, one radio goes through its process and then and makes its adaptation, that then changes the observations that other systems may make. All right. So this makes an adaptation because this one make an adaptation because this one make an adaptation and so on. And this is being a much more complicated process because of these interactions and the wide latitudes that we give to these systems to learn and, and adapt for what they see as their best interest and what they think is the best interest of the network. Um, so the takeaway from this slide is that when we go and look at cognitive radio deployments and unlicensed and, and uh, secondary systems, uh, their actual operation is not just a function of what the primary user is doing, but also what uh, their secondary users are doing. And they may be part of your system, or they may be outside of your system, but still in band with you. And you need to be cognizant of those interactions and design mechanisms to, uh, to accommodate those. And those mechanisms are your coexistence mechanisms. And that's the topic of today. And I did not put together a, watch this, real-time editing, because there's hard to read. off that there. Alrighty. Um, so uh, what kind of issues can, can show up with that? One of the issues that 
Uh, we at CRT are typically most concerned with our issues of stability and convergence and is in that, uh, will the, uh, the deployment end up uh, behaving in a way that you can plan and accommodate for and, and get the kind of performance that you're expecting to get. And these kind of issues are not purely a function of it being a cognitive radio. It's, it's really a function of any kind of interactive uh, process between intelligent agents. Um, one illustration of this is the, uh, the flash crash, uh, which back in 2010, when the, uh, the stock market uh, had a 10% swing in the span of, uh, of a couple minutes um, due to the interactions between human traders and uh, automated uh, trading routines. Um, basically, uh, threshold after threshold were triggered in the automated routines, which sent a, uh, a gigantic cascade of, of sell-offs rapidly uh, dropping off the uh, the price of the stock market before it uh, it climbed back at uh, almost immediately as quickly afterwards. Um, there's actually a large number of of interesting things going on in the stock market these days as the different automated programs uh, play games with each other to cause each other to sell off when they might not otherwise would. Um, um, so there's um, uh, lots of fun interactions going on in the background there. So, um, and while that was a very quick uh, instability there, that snap down, snap back up, um, it happens at other time scales, and and the the time scale is really a function of how quickly can uh, that intelligent agent make a decision. So, if you look at that chart uh, from from the uh, um, stock market in the top right and kind of flip it over, that looks almost like what the uh, the housing market. Uh, um, Schiller index looks like for, for the last several decades in which it was a sudden spike up and then a sudden spike back down. And that's not from automated trading, that's from humans uh, buying and selling houses. And uh, the, the process was much longer of course because it's, you can make a, a stock trade in, in uh, milliseconds or less, but uh, you're not going to close uh, your, your uh, uh, closing a house uh, for at least a month, sometimes much, much more. So it slows down the, the process, but you can still get the same basic shape and the same kind of instability. Um, so those are the kind of things that you, ha you have to be concerned with when you've got multiple intelligent agents coming together. Um, so that's kind of uh, a bit away from wireless networks. Let's look at a uh, wireless network example, and, and this is uh, an older network. Uh, it's uh, going to be decked. Uh, I've, I've got examples laying around for uh, white space proposals too, but uh, this is nice to illustrate how long we've had these kind of issues. Uh, and uh, in decked, um, you have to, to worry about other uh, cordless phones uh, operating in the environment. And if you want to, to maximize your performance, you want to find the, the clearest channel you can get, and so you'll want to switch away from them. Uh, from, from other systems that may be there. Uh, not only is that good for you, that's also arguably a uh, polite protocol because by you getting out of the way, it in theory performs, uh, improves their performance as well. However, uh, the way that DEC was implemented, uh, the, the observations aren't uh, what we at CRT would call symmetric. And because of that, um, while uh, one link is looking out for itself, it can uh, cause the system to, to go unstable. So. Let's assume that we've got these three links here, and uh, and I've we're going to look at the the kind of uh, propagation losses between uh, the the base units and the um, and the handhelds, and it's deck to set up so that the uh, decision for which channel to operate on is a function of what channel the uh, the handheld is seeing as the most clear, uh, not so much what the uh, the base unit is seeing. Uh, but you'll get interference both from other phones and from other base units. Um, the the phone to phone is kind of symmetric, so we'll drop that out for the moment. But the uh, the impact from other base units is not. Um, so uh, let's consider what kind of interference this would the uh, this phone one would see. It would see uh, some kind of interference from the base units, kind of interference from from this other base unit over there, and we'll assume that it sees more from from three than it does from two. Uh, likewise, we'll assume that 
that uh, two sees more from one than it does from three, and that uh, three sees more from two than, than from, from one. Uh, I threw numbers in there, it doesn't really make a difference. What matters is, is that relationship up there. So uh, we'll assume for the sake of argument that there are two channels and only two channels because if I draw the 120 or so channels and in a matrix, you guys aren't going to be able to read it. Plus, I'll need a lot more phones to make this work. Um, so, but if you assume that the system op starts off on some kind of channel, it'd be better if they could, you know, split themselves up. So some link is going to detect that and, and want to get out of the way. So let's assume that uh, link one. Uh, first one to, to get a chance to make an adaptation and uh, that the, the timing is done such that there's no adaptation collisions so it gets out of the way and then everyone correctly observes that. Uh, so that then leads to a situation where link 2 and link 3 are sharing with each other but because of this relationship up here uh, and that uh, 2 is, is seeing, uh, uh, sorry, that 3 is, is seeing, would see more inference from 2 than it would from 1, 3 would actually rather be in band with 1 than with 2. So it'll make its adaptation to, to go back in one, but one would be better off because it's being measured at the, uh, at the uh, handheld only, would rather be in band with two than with three. So it makes its adaptation and so on and so on. And it goes into an infinite loop. So uh, the um, things that fall out of that in terms of generalized insights is that if you operate in any kind of scenario where you're really having to share your resources, i.e. you have more uh, systems or links or, or, or nodes that you're trying to allocate resources to than you have orthogonal resources, then if you don't do something special, then you'll have uh, a non-zero chance of, of going into this kind of loops. And in general, as you have more uh, systems to allocate resources to than you, than you have uh, orthogonal resources, that the looping probability will go to one. Um, you can mitigate this by making certain you have more orthogonal resources than you have uh, channels, uh, than you have uh, uh, systems to allocate to. Uh, DEC, for instance, has 120 channels. Um, you can also reduce the frequency of adaptations. Uh, DEC, for instance, only adapts every 30 minutes, so who really cares if it's, if it's looping around? And uh, then you also have to have uh, more than 120 uh, free, uh, more than 120 uh, 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 base unit uh, handheld combinations before uh, it'll even matter. Uh, but in both cases, you're wasting spectrum. Uh, you're leaving performance on the table, and we're expecting to be operating in a congested, heavily congested environment as we go forward. Otherwise, there's not such a need for uh, the TV white space and other kind of cognitive radio applications. And, uh, you see the same kind of process described as rippling in, uh, in Wi-Fi networks. And um, one issue that you have with a centralized solution, which uh, if you want me to get around this, this kind of interaction, is to only have one decision process. Is, uh, centralized solutions have issues in terms of scaling to, uh, to, large, uh, well, to, to large scale, large numbers of, of controlled assets. Uh, because of the time to communicate everyone's information back to the, the central point and then make a decision and then get it back out. Um, so you tend to have to do some kind of hierarchical or, or otherwise partial distribution and then even if it is an enterprise network, you can still get the same kind of problem. So, um, so that's instability, which it's annoying. It's not the, the end of the world. You've wasted resources. You, you'll have your uh, depending upon your, your the robustness of your system, it, it may matter greatly or it may matter only a little. But you could also have situations in where what makes sense when you're operating on your own uh, makes for, for much worse performance when you have other systems there, uh, which you didn't really consider in, in, in your initial design that you're not taking into account in terms of coexistence. So uh, what I have here is a uh, Quick example, let's assume that each, we have a, oh, I, I've got Wi-Fi drawn, uh, old Linksys router there. Uh, and, uh, but this really could apply to any wireless protocol. Assume that uh, each link would like to get the best possible SINR that they could, but the only free variable that they have to, uh, to control is uh, the transmit power level. Uh, as, uh, so with SINR being measured, say, at the base. 
um, at the access point. And if we let these guys uh, run, uh, I'll quickly illustrate this, this, that the blue bar being the transit power and the green bar being the measured SINR. If we let them run, the uh, the fixed point, the, the point that these guys will end up converging to is a point where everyone's transmitting at maximum power. And arguably that's kind of as, as good as you could do because then that minimizes the, the contribution of noise and it's just interference, uh, which may or may not matter uh, on, depending upon uh, the specific wireless network you're working with. And, um, but it's not generally a solution that we want uh, due to power consumption considerations and harmonics that get introduced to transmitting at higher power. Um, so this would be a... Uh, a solution which what made sense for a single link once there were other links doing the same thing was ends up being a, uh, a bad solution. Likewise, if there's a system that uh, you did not account for ahead of time uh, that's not even running the same algorithm, you can also get very bad performance. Uh, Wi-Fi uh, is known as a polite protocol in that it will you know, listen before talk and uh, if it detects a, a signal that's strong enough, uh, it'll not, not transmit. And one of the issues you have is if you have a uh, particular many different uh, ISM band uh, camera systems, video camera systems will transmit continuously. Um, so you get a nice continuous feed of, of whatever you're seeing. Uh, but since those are transmitting continuously and your Wi-Fi system is uh, polite and will back off whenever it sees uh, uh, another signal, then the Wi-Fi system won't ever get to transmit. It's been effectively blocked out because it's too polite because you didn't consider uh, what other kinds of systems are there uh, in, in the, uh, the initial design there. So, um, so you have to consider more than what's going to happen with just your one link or just your one system. What happens when there's other systems there? So um, I'll skip over that because I'm already 25 minutes in. Um, I'll um, hit repeated games, uh, not at all, um, other than to me, me saying that, that um, there are many, many bad things that happen when you implement uh, punishment schemes to uh, uh, leverage the, the Nash folk theorem, um, particularly due to uh, imperfect information and, and, and uh, imperfect observations as well as what happens when you have a node that's not playing by the rules at all, uh, i.e. Is, is actually a malicious node that it can cause catastrophic failures to your network. Um, but uh, a different kind of uh, technique uh, that doesn't require the, the kind of uh, mechanisms involved with punishment and repeated games is uh, defined in uh, classic games and as potential games. And in a potential game, uh, there's a function that's hiding in the background that's describing emergent behavior of, of the network or of the system, uh, such that every time a, a radio makes an adaptation, makes a, a decision, uh, that function is increasing. So I kind of visualize that as the invisible hand of cognitive radio as such, that uh, this is function going up in the background all the time. Um, and there's several different classes of potential games. I'm not going to to those in, in this talk, um, but uh, to illustrate an example of that, uh, this is uh, something that we did for Wi-Fi like seven years ago, ish, uh, which we're doing dynamic frequency selection with uh, access nodes and various clusters and so on. And uh, what's being shown on the right is the behavior of the system. Uh, one, the top part is the channel choice by each of the, the access nodes. Notice that we have many more access nodes than we have channels, so they end up having coincident lines there. Uh, so every time you see a line like this, this is an adaptation that's occurring. Uh, this down here is uh, the goal, the utility function of, of that, uh, that system, that, whether it's a cluster or, or a link, uh, that's trying to, to uh, in this case, uh, minimize a, a modified version of interference. And then down here is uh, actually what would be the potential function, but negated because the negated version of the potential function is closely related to the uh, average interference level being seen in the network. And because of the way we end up designing it, this function ends up being monotonically decreasing over time, uh, which ends up having a number of nice properties we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, 
Now this is an example of a distributed uh, DFS algorithm, but uh, and there's many other things that we've done with, with routing and topology and combinations of these with power and, and beamforming and so on, uh, which I don't assume people will be familiar with. Uh, but hopefully you've read papers where uh, uh, coexistence mechanisms or resource sharing mechanisms are, are based off of uh, sharing tokens or, or paying uh, some kind of uh, uh, fee f to a uh, owner in real time or, or someone who's willing to, to yield resources in real time uh, to, to gain access to, to, uh, to, to yield access to that resource. And those are also examples of potential games. Uh, if I wanted to be more precise, it's going to be an example of, a, of an ordinal potential game as opposed to this one over here, which was uh, an exact potential game. Uh, and, and hiding in the background there is every time a trade is made, uh, the assumption is that both sides of the trade are, have benefited from that trade in some shape, form, or fashion, and no one else is affected. So there's this uh, overall social warfare function that can be defined hiding in the background that's uh, monotonically improving. Um, so what does that monotonicity end up buying you? It means that you can find steady states of the, of the system by finding, solving for maximizers of, of that potential function. Um, that's necessarily mean that uh, you'll get to one particular one or another because frequently there'll be many of them. Uh, you all get convergence for a huge number of, of conditions uh, in terms of timing and, and the kinds of decision rules that are being followed. Uh, but what it doesn't necessarily mean if you implement a potential game is that you got good good performance. Uh, the last two examples I described, uh, you would get good performance. Um, but that power control algorithm I showed before would also be an example of a potential game where the potential function would be the uh, average transmit power level would be one of the, the possible potential functions. Um, so uh, there's a good bit of art and design to, to getting uh, the uh, getting a system that be have this uh, nice emergent property and have the emergent property align with your, your design objectives. Uh, but if you want a, a quick rule to go about doing it, if you take such a, a token economy, then uh, for many definitions of, of good, uh, you'll get good performance uh, uh, using such an approach. Uh, as long as the information that the uh, systems are making the decisions off of are, are reasonably timely and, and reasonably reliably. And if you're concerned with the equitab uh, equitability of the resulting steady state in terms of who gets what resources, then you'll have to take that into account in terms of your initial resource allocation as far as who owns which resources and who gets which tokens initially. But, uh, but you can get good performance fairly easily that way when it makes sense to model it as a uh, token economy. Um, I mentioned fairness. Uh, one of the issues with, uh, uh, principal issues with coexistence is ensuring that every system gets the kind of performance that they need to, to complete their task, as it was being referred to in, in .15.2, or uh, is not significantly degraded in terms of the uh, uh, EMC definition from NATO. Um, but uh, many different uh, developers will want to have a quote unquote fair system. And my general review of, of fair is that fair means different things to different analysts, but uh, when you look at people, uh, fair or unfair uh, is really a shorthand for I got what I deserved or I didn't get what I think I deserved. Um, so it's a very loose concept. Uh, there are some more formal concepts, uh, more rigorous metrics defined in economics and game theory like the Gini, co Gini coefficient, the Thiel index, and Atkinson index. Um, but one of the things that, that is useful out of there for uh, uh, designing coexistence algorithms is, is uh, prioritized um, fairness. Um, proportionally fair scheduling would be an example of a, uh, a weighted fairness metric. So those end up showing up as well. Uh, another concept from game theory or economics that's useful for discussing coexistence is the price of anarchy. And uh, the, the key idea behind the price of anarchy is that the assumption is that a distributed solution will never reform better than an omniscient centralized solution. Uh, distributed solutions having to search around and centralized solution can enforce these uh, the whole system or whole network to, to go operate at whatever states they want to. Um, the practicality of that, um, uh, it may or may not be reasonable. There's costs in implementing those kinds of, of uh, 
coordination yet in terms of the communication back to the uh, centralized uh, decision maker, uh, or even if you're just coordinating decisions, uh, uh, similar sort of rule of thumb, the coordinated decisions will end up typically performing better than an uncoordinated decision unless you've done a lot of special stuff. Um, but that's ignoring the, the overhead associated with a coordinated or centralized solution. So, but uh, there's a sample calculation if you guys ever want to uh, go through that. Uh, another useful concept is uh, Pareto efficiency. And you'll say that uh, an allocation is Pareto efficient if you can't find any other allocation such that how the other uh, radios or systems would be assigning value to. You can't find another one where uh, someone's made some radio or whatnot is made better off without anyone being made worse off. Um, another way to, to look at that is um, you, there's no, uh, you didn't leave any resources on the table. There's, there's not a way in which you can uh, bring more to bear to, to improve overall performance. Um, uh, so, um, just a quick highlight off of this is that what's good or efficient is not necessarily what your steady states are. Um, like, uh, if you look at this game down here, I'm not going through uh, how, how to read that too closely uh, due to time, but uh, uh, this down here would be your, your resulting steady state as an example of what's known as prisoner's dilemma. Uh, whereas these up here would all be better states to operate at, uh, would all be considered to be Pareto efficient. Um, and over here we have one state in this game over here, this is kind of a, uh, a matching pennies kind of game. Or a, um, uh, uh, and uh, this particular point here happens to be Pareto efficient and, uh, and a fixed point. Um, one key difference for looking at cognitive radio kind of applications is Normally in proto-efficiency, as I said, a good rule of thumb is did you leave any resources on the table that you could have assigned to, to get uh, better performance for someone or, or multiple uh, networks? And sometimes in cognitive radio systems, you're going to have to leave some resources on the table. Uh, that can be for uh, managing quiet periods, or there could just be other applications there, or you might want to, might uh, need to be reserving some spectrum for the unknown system that you're not able to detect or, or that you're otherwise unaware of, but you think might be there. Um, so that kind of principle shows up in a number of different uh, standards. So, excuse me, I'm drinking water while I'm talking, so I occasionally pause. So. Uh, and feel free to interrupt as I'm going through through uh, through this. I'm going to hop into some uh, protocols and, and what they've done for for coexistence, and try to highlight some of the themes that, that I talked about in terms of the general aspects of coexistence, coexistence in the previous slides. So, was someone saying something? Yeah, this is Lee. There, uh, there was a question that was asked. Um, do potential games always result in a Pareto efficient solution? Um, no, uh, no, not at all. Um, uh, I'll come back up to here. Actually, this game here is also uh, happens to be a uh, potential game. Uh, the Prisoner's Dilemma is a potential game. It's just not a potential game you want to implement. So here's an example where uh, the resulting, the expected resulting behavior would be down in this state, whereas any of the other three states that the system could have taken would have been pre-efficient. So the answer to the question is, is no. Um, so I, I'm hoping my, my audio wasn't too low, because I could normally how loud I'm hearing other people talk is how loud uh, they're hearing me talk. Uh, and, and Lee was quite quiet then. So um, any other questions? So uh, the first coexistence protocol that uh, uh, we'll, we'll glance at uh, quickly is the distributed coordination function from dot eleven, and that's been amended and modified various times for for the various uh, uh, Mac amendments to, to dot eleven. And dot eleven was uh, that that distributed coordination function was concerned with a few different things. One. Uh, how do you go about discovering when there's a hidden node there? 
how do you know that you're having to, to coexist with others? I mentioned that that's a key issue uh, to, to be able to, to know uh, is there someone there that you need to be changing what you're doing and ideally who they are. Uh, DCF doesn't really help you on its own to find out who they are, but you could also implement simple things to figure out if it's a, uh, another .11 uh, system or not, and that starts being done in, in .11Y uh, in terms of looking at the kind of systems. Um, so there's a, um, uh, a chance for systems to discover other ones, uh, hidden nodes, and then there's also a desire to kind of share the, uh, uh, the spectrum somewhat equitably. Um, so uh, the, how that ends up playing out is that there's a listen before talk aspect for it, uh, where uh, your .11 uh, devices will ensure that uh, no one is, is transmitting at a signal level above a certain threshold, and, and that threshold is a function of the, the bandwidth that they're working with, uh, minus 82 dBm for 20 megahertz, and I think that goes down to minus 88 for uh, for uh, for five uh, from uh, for narrower bandwidths, and uh, and after they're certain that no one's talking via the the RTS and, and CTS uh, coming back, uh, then they can actually start communicating. In addition to to this, there's also uh, random uh, back off windows to allow for. Uh, other systems to, to communicate and via the, the processes of that uh, random back off growing and shrinking as you have more collisions, uh, you end up sharing the, uh, the spectrum uh, somewhat well. There's, there's certainly a lot of, of, of bandwidth is being left on the table that way because it's a purely uncoordinated uh, coexistence scheme. Um, so uh, other ones, uh, modified versions of that include the, uh, the point coordination function where um, you vary your interframe, uh, your effective interframe spacing sum, uh, and uh, uh, it allows a system to, uh, to go through and do some uh, scheduling access node to, to clients um, by, by messing around with that, uh, that interframe spacing a little bit. Um, there's also a hybrid coordination function, which I don't have slides on, that allows some prioritization as well. Uh, but one of the takeaways I want you to have from this is uh, the overhead that ends up being associated with, with doing this, uh, particularly when uh, a .11 device doesn't, isn't able to take into account what specific other kind of system that's there. Um, when the, the, the system is designed so that it'll fall back to the uh, lowest level of, of, of communication uh, to ensure that uh, uh, its RTS-CTS messages are being uh, accommodated. So if you have a original flavor of .11 uh, with, uh, with CCK as opposed to uh, uh, OFDM, say, then uh, when those RTS-CTS messages go out, they have to be in that uh, older protocol, which is much less uh, efficient, and so that it means that you end up spending a larger fraction of your time, of your transmission time, uh, sending that uh, inefficiently encoded uh, um, RTS-CTS kind of information, and less time sending on, on your actual net throughput. Uh, so accordingly, most uh, uh, more recent .11 Amendments provide uh, mechanisms for discovering uh, what other kinds of .11 systems are there, and then they'll only fall back as far as they absolutely have to, with the goal of, of operating in the highest possible mode, so they get the uh, the least penalty in terms of uh, uh, of overhead to, for backwards compatibility. Um, another apologize for for that graphic there. I, I I'll see if I can find the the a clean one before I, I upload it. Upload this today. Um, the the DCF is purely a uh, coexistence mechanism in terms of time sharing of a particular channel, uh, but you can do much better once you start considering uh, separating systems in terms of, of frequency, and then looking at another way of being polite in terms of transmitting at less power when you can to uh, accommodate uh, other systems there. So .11H, DFS, and transmit power control. And if you want to look at uh, um, 
what that kind of means in terms of, of throughput gains. Uh, well, I don't have it on here, but loosely, uh, if I had drawn a line here, that would have been about where uh, your inference levels would have been on average for your uh, uh, systems without DFS at all uh, through there. Uh, that's and so you get a, getting capacity here-ish. Once you start adding in DFS, uh, this is an average uh, uh, interference level, and this is your minus 82 dBm collision threshold. Uh, so you can start getting a uh, capacity that's about three times more out here. And if you add in some transit power control with it too, it, it shifts on the curve significantly, and it's another uh, easy tripling uh, of capacity again, uh, just by being polite and making use of, of additional resources and, and sorting themselves out. Um, and uh, not just having your dial and access point work on channel six all the time as it comes out of the, uh, the box phone from the vendor. Uh, so this is where politeness is kind of helping uh, performance significantly. So dot uh, 11y adds additional flavors to, to coexistence. Uh, they're assuming that there will be other kinds of systems there, but uh, that dot 11 doesn't want to uh, protect the, the non-primary users anywhere near as much as they would other dot 11 users. So they still have an energy detection threshold, but they changed it so that uh, it would have to be 10 dB greater than the, the corresponding bandwidth uh, threshold that you would have had before for anything that is not recoverable as a uh, .11 system. So now you've got a little bit of awareness of is this another .11 system or is it something else. Um, so this also kind of was an initial um, I view as kind of the model for, for the TV white space came from too in that there's a database of, of assisting devices and, and all the different uh, ones want to operate secondarily or light licenses such and are registered in the uh, uh, in the area, and, and they have a right to transmit, but aren't necessarily protected, um, and uh, uh, other things that end up being used for for uh, for 11 AF in terms of uh, dependent station enablement and so on. Um, but here, key thing about this is that additional they change the threshold based off of who you are. Um, so then, James, 11 AF. We have another yeah. question. Yeah, go ahead. We have another question. Uh, is there any chance that TV white space devices will use sensing-based DFS methods, or is it clear they will be provided spectrum by querying a geolocation database in the USA? Is it clear that they will be provided? They will be definitely provided the available channel list uh, by that geolocation database. Um, beyond that, as far as what channel they end up choosing to operate in from that available channel list, uh, there will be some kind of sensing there uh, for, for most of the systems in order to characterize what's a, a, a channel that's interfered by other systems or not. Um, the question uh, that's less clear is how much of a role will dot nineteen uh, dot one end up playing in terms of simplifying that coexistence between uh, dissimilar um, uncoordinated systems uh, that have the same uh, channel availability list and trying to choose which channels to operate off of. Uh, there's going to be spectrum managers that can make that kind of decision uh, for the, the systems, uh, but it's also supposed to be some distributed algorithm supported in, in dot .19 that would allow that to be pushed out on the edge. If you push that out on the edge, then, then sensing for characterizing your own performance and interference from other secondary systems will be there. As far as sensing of primary users, uh, that's not going to be in, in the TV white space. Uh, it may show up in other um, cognitive radio unlicensed bands going forward for, for uh, primary users, but I, I don't know of a system that's gotten over the, uh, the FCC detection reliability threshold yet, and, and I don't see it happening soon. So, uh, good question. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, Dial 11 AF is a TV white space um, protocol uh, wrapping up ish uh, sometime, I think 2014 um, is the goal. And its principal coexistence mechanism uh, is the Dial 11 Y coexistence mechanism. Uh, so that same uh, variation in terms of the detection threshold with uh, uh, a little DFS and, and transit power control to, to politely get out of the way in a way that's also good for, the, for themselves. So um, that's 
slight change in the enablement uh, diagram, which not so important for this. Um, so that's another uncoordinated system. The, the, the next couple of systems that we'll look at uh, do something that's much more coordinated, uh, principally within their own like system, so dot .16 with dot .16, dot .22 with dot .22, and, and they can be segmented so that it's within your own uh, uh, enterprise kind of deployment, or it could be, uh, in theory, if your policies allow it across uh, dissimilar systems. So dot .16H uh, was more or less WiMAX for the uh, 365 band initially, but then it kind of grew in scope to TD white space, which was a fun little debate with dot .22 for a while. Um, but uh, it implements several things that I've kind of talked about before in terms of uh, token-based negotiation for resources between folks, uh, between uh, systems, interference avoidance, uh, some collaboration. It also provides a uh, uh, mechanism for coexistence with non-dot 16H systems via the CXCDP uh, protocol, uh, which both allows for uh, quiet times for the system to transmit, but here because it's coexisting with non-dot 16H systems, it goes back into that same kind of mode that uh, dot 11 did in terms of you do a listen before talk and there's an exponential back off. Uh, that's kind of been a uh, uh, converge upon common solution for sharing inspection uh, fairly and equitably uh, without having to coordinate. Um, but one thing that's very interesting with that 16H uh, that they proposed was let's assume that you can coordinate what you're doing and uh, that you're location aware and time aware and, and uh, you can do all sorts of nice coordinating things and you can really up your, uh, your spectral efficiency. So this is uh, uh, illustrating one of the things that Dexnish does to really offer uh, special efficiency. Uh, if you have, say, multiple um, uh, uh, base stations, access points, uh, what do you want to call them there, uh, they'll end up splitting up their time into periods of time which they get to communicate uh, all in parallel, and the time in which, uh, right through here, and the time in which they're having to uh, share the spectrum, and they split it up in time there, and time and space. So, the uh, each uh, base station is responsible for figuring out uh, where its users are, and uh, they end up being coordinated with other uh, stations to figure out uh, which set of users would be able to communicate with without interfering with, uh, say, users in, in another. Uh, another uh, attached to another base station, and which users would be uh, interfered if they both talked at the same time. So all the users that are in a non-interfered area are able to uh, transmit at the same time, so they have that period. And then for all the other parts, that ends up getting coordinated so that they can time slot out from each other to uh, uh, address the need of bandwidth for, for each of those number of users and, and, and share the, the spectrum somewhat equitably. Uh, equitably meaning not just an even distribution, but based off priorities and, and, and need. So um, to do that, uh, they added in a uh, some extra uh, signaling uh, beyond uh, what would be there normally to allow base stations to, to talk with other base stations and, and, and talk through subscriber stations to other subscriber stations um, through gaps in the uplink and, and downlink frames. Um, so they had to add an extra overhead, extra um, uh, infrastructure to, to, the, to the signals in order to support this kind of coordination. Um, and because they're now coordinating both in terms of this communication in those gaps and, and over here, you also had to add in a, a common time base and ensure that all the systems are synchronized, whereas for the dot eleven ones, you don't really have to synchronize them at all. They'll they'll take care of themselves. Uh, in fact, it's actually notionally better for them to be completely unsynchronized so that uh, the random back off timers work better. So, uh, so then once they're able to communicate with each other the way that they actually go about doing that, uh, splitting up of spectrum for their uh, possibly interfering groups is that the, the base stations will get together for what's called an interference group uh, or interference community and then you'll have a master base station that can either assign transmit timings or you can uh, um, to, to slave base stations in the interference group or one master base station can advertise spectrum for rent to other uh, master base stations and they implement that same kind of token economy that, that I've been uh, emphasizing and then 
in theory, every base station is supposed to be maintaining a database of what resources they're using and what kind of interference they've been seeing and from where and what they look like and they can share this to, to make better decisions and, and in theory support uh, later more enhanced uh, spectrum managers that may, may come down the line. So, so dot 22 uh, and talking about the, the base standard not the 22.1 or 22.2 uh, they have a few different things similar to, to dot 16H but they also uh, allow, you, allow the system to scale back how much of the frame that's being used for actual communications versus uh, releasing it for either for, for sensing or for other systems to, to use. So that's a, a different kind of a, a politeness in the scaling of a frame size which is normally a fixed unit but you don't have to, to occupy all of it. Another interesting thing that ended up being included was uh, the, the notion of a spectrum manager for, for dot 22 and as opposed to having these kind of uh, predefined solutions that you run all the time over here, uh, the Spectrum Manager is, is intended to uh, be able to change out what the system is using for its uh, Spectrum Management solution based off of its perception of, of what's going on in the environment. So this again gets back to the you can do much better if you're aware of, uh, of what's going on and, and adapt your solutions accordingly. So. Um, then uh, uh, other things that I'm going in there is they, they have a polite mechanism for, for minimizing uh, or backing off transmit power. Also, they, they have a token exchange, interbase station communication, which can either be over the air or through, uh, through backhaul or through uh, your uh, fixed line connection. And one of the things I like to emphasize to folks uh, with TV white space is to, to make use of that fixed line connection. It's effectively uh, virtually costless to, to allow for the, uh, the collaboration, which can be uh, quite expensive. And then they also have uh, over the air kind of things that are done too. So that works well for uh, within a system, but what happens when you have to go between systems? And that's uh, the focus of .19.1, uh, which uh, I think they've gotten through a couple drafts now. Uh, and uh, although it's still evolving. A uh, couple different notion diagrams, but if you look at it uh, uh, right, both of the, the figure up top right and, and bottom right are, are the same. Uh, they have a few different components where you assume that you have your TV white space for, for channel availability and some kind, some kind of system that's managing a, a particular network like that, that 22 spectrum manager or so on. And then there's a coexistence manager, which is useful for uh, um, uh, this uh, um, uh, separating out and managing the issues between different systems um, going on there. So they, they support a number of different uh, services in .19.1 such as device discovery. So rather than necessarily having to do it over the air, uh, since uh, all the uh, uh, control uh, units uh, in the TV white space are registered in their location and their ID and you know what IP address they came from, you can do device discovery through the uh, through the databases that way. Um, and then also, uh, in theory, allows for multiple different kinds of decision techniques and topologies. And, and it's supposed to also support uh, uh, coordinating the sensing uh, as well between the different systems. Because um, uh, if, if, in theory, you ever wanted to go back and, and, and have coordinated quiet periods, it doesn't do much good to have your dot 16 network in the area schedule a quiet period while your dot 22 is transmitting. So then you have some kind of coordination on so, uh, wrapping up and almost hitting my time exactly, um, coexistence issues and, and many of the still being used solutions uh, in some shape, form, or fashion predate the TV white spaces. So you saw uh, somewhat famously, I'm going to cover it in here, uh, the coexistence issues that, that uh, arose from the, uh, the Wi-Fi Bluetooth uh, interference issues, which went to adaptive frequency hopping and so on. Um, if you ignore the cost of overhead or infrastructure, uh, the performance of a distributed solution is not going to be better than a centralized solution. That's the, the underlying concept behind the price of anarchy. If that overhead is significant, then the distributed solution can matter. If timing matters a lot, then, then that distributed solution can also be better. But if you can find a, a way in which that overhead goes way down because, say, you've got uh, um, <coughs> GPS already required for location and timing and, you, and you've already got a common interface for talking to a database, you might as well use that also for device discovery uh, since it's low cost, although that will maybe lower speed than you need, but it depends upon what you're trying to do. Um, so the, just satisfy the TV white space regs 
has moved coexistence more from a, a pure distributed kind of system to, uh, to systems that are starting to be more coordinated uh, because of the um, infrastructure that's required just to satisfy the regs. Um, issue that I didn't get into here, but it's important to be aware of, is that your information quality matters a lot, whether it's distributed or if it's uh, uh, coordinated or centralized. And does that factors into both security and authentication, but then how good is your sensing algorithm if you're doing sensing and, and, and what happens uh, when, when you're wrong with that. And particularly if your assumptions are wrong, uh, in terms of device discovery and classifying what's there and, then, and what you're using to make a decision, then you can get some very bad performance. We saw that with uh, uh, the amount of overhead that shows up with legacy coexistence with dot eleven, or if you're not figuring out what's there right with video cameras in dot eleven, or if it's a uh, malicious node as opposed to just a, uh, uh, a, a malfunctioning radio. And so being able to figure out are, are the assumptions in the system well aligned with uh, uh, what went into the initial design and what kind of algorithms should be deployed based off of the current scenario is kind of a traditional role for an artificial intelligence expert system uh, which you're doing some kind of a case-based reasoning to classify. So that's a, another role for cognitive radio beyond just the is my primary user there. So with that I'll stop and, and I'll take questions as long as people are, are willing to ask them. I don't have Anything scheduled for, for an hour or so? So are there any questions? Uh, good morning. This is Mike Quinn from the MITRE Corporation in Stafford, Virginia. How, how, did, how do we think this is going to scale into um, overseas locations uh, out of the continental United States, for instance? All right, so this, I'm going to, by this, do you mean uh, the regulations, or do you mean the protocols, or do you mean the inter interaction between the protocols and the regulations? I was thinking more about specifically the use of the TV white space spectrum, but, I mean, all of those things that you mentioned are relevant. All right, so uh, regulation-wise, um, in Europe, it's varying right now as far as what they're doing with it. Some of them are, are putting it up, up for auction, uh, I think that's Germany's approach. The UK's approach is very much looking to support unlicensed kind of uh, devices. Um, Ofcom's been pushing that fairly hard. So it's going to be, uh, it's probably going to be patchwork. Um, the US is a big market which will tend to make it happen, maybe, uh, not that the, uh, it's happened too quickly yet. Um, but that implies a need for uh, policy radios which we didn't really get into here other than I think I mentioned policy somewhere on one slide, that uh, what the radios can do are going to be a function of where they are and, and longer term when they are uh, and, and what other demands would come in, particularly when you look at uh, uh, what's going to end up happening with federal sharing where um, the federal users are going to be able to, to preempt uh, the commercial users and, and they'll come and go and not always be there. So that's a time and location kind of policy change or time-based uh, policy change versus the different countries changes. Uh, as far as what that means for the protocols themselves, um, all of these are fairly flexible. Um, uh, I know when I was talking to uh, a poor of about that 22, uh, he, he told me that uh, even when they took out the spectrum sensing requirement, it didn't really matter for dot 22. It was so flexible they can just cut out uh, the part of the frame on, on the fly that would have been allocated for sensing, and, and they're okay. And if it ever ends up being a uh, 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 a later policy requirement they have to have sensing, then the, the protocol allows you to go right back in without having to, to change the, anything that's been fielded as long as you're actually implementing all of the, uh, the parts of the standard. Uh, the question would then become, uh, since it's not needed in the existing protocols, how well would they actually test for that uh, uh, for uh, uh, when doing your, your system testing for uh, certification now. So. Um, so it's going to be varied. Uh, many of the protocols, it's they'll be able to accommodate um, uh, the the variances, uh, but there's going to be a role for uh, for policy radios to, to to make it work. So, James, you had another question that was submitted. Um, what are the key security aspects 
uh, that you see for TV white space devices must address? For TV white space devices that you must address? Uh, you got to have uh, secure access to, to that database, uh, particularly what goes into it. Uh, um, if that information is bad, uh, it impacts lots and lots of different systems. Um, and so everyone's drawing from that. Uh, so <coughs> that's, that's uh, foremost. Um, then uh, general uh, authentication of this is indeed a, uh, uh, a, a portable device that's allowed to, to be a controller. And it's not um, uh, someone that uh, uh, is, is spoofing uh, a controller, because then they could cause a lot of havoc in, in, in a particular region. Um, actual authentication kind of all the way up and down is, is if you're implementing .19, uh, yeah, is the system that's providing your, your coexistence instructions actually the, the guy you think it is? And that then is going to also require uh, encryption of, of your communications between the, uh, uh, the systems uh, so that you can't be hit with a man in the middle. Um, so uh, all the traditional uh, comm security things show up there. Um, there's other security things that could play out, which I, I'm not as concerned with for, for commercial applications uh, like the TV white space where um, uh, you could have malicious nodes that are subverting your coexistence mechanisms to, uh, to cause much worse performance. Um, uh, that's more of an issue when you've got, uh, say, military or, or government systems where there's more of an incentive to, to, to do uh, bad things. And then there's another issue associated with sharing spectrum with uh, federal users, and that's the uh, obfuscation of what goes into uh, the databases because if you have uh, all your f uh, federal users registering, here's where I am at this time, um, that could be giving away troop movements, it could be giving away sensitive uh, um, uh, movements of um, FBI agents as they're closing in on, on, a, uh, on a suspect. Uh, um, so uh, being able to protect that information in a way that um, one keeps the uh, uh, secondary users from knowing exactly what was in the uh, database and then um, makes it unclear enough that they're not able to back reason out either uh, what was really going on there it is an extra security issue associated with um, uh, sharing with, with federal users. So um, all the good, so summarizing all the good things associated with uh, uh, authenticating and, and encrypting your communications uh, for make certain you're, you're talking to who you're talking to and, and the, the more uh, systems under control, the, the more important that that, uh, that becomes. Um, there's some concern with, with hostile users. Uh, that's more of a concern with, with uh, um, government users. Uh, then uh, uh, when we go to federal sharing, uh, obfuscating what going, is going into the databases. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, with that, um, James, why don't we uh, why don't we wrap things up? All right. Well, thank you, guys. I got just a couple of uh, additional quick announcements. The uh, next webinar that the forum is going to be holding will be on September 25th at 7 a.m. Pacific. Uh, the topic is the latest design strategies using Xilinx Vertex 7 FPGAs for software radio. And that webinar will be presented by Roger Hosking, who's the vice president and co-founder of Pentec. Um, we're going to be sending everyone a link to a satisfaction survey for this webinar. Uh, we really appreciate it if uh, people would fill out that uh, survey. It's, it's very short, but it provides us information we can use in making these better for you. Uh, so please provide us your feedback. Uh, if you want to send me any feedback directly, please feel free to email me at lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org. And finally, the last point for the day is we are currently accepting uh, 
we have a request for proposals out for our next webinar. Uh, these will be given in November and December. So if people are interested in, uh, in submitting a webinar uh, proposal, uh, please go to wirelessinnovation.org slash webinars, tutorials, resources, and uh, there's a form that you can fill out there. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for participating today. Uh, we hope this has been valuable for you, and thank you to James for uh, for taking the time to um, for taking the time to do this. I've just got one last question: Do we know the link for the recording yet, or will it be in the survey email? It will be in the survey email, and so we'll send you the uh, the link then. So with that, I'll uh, call the session to a close. Thanks, everyone.